Chapter Thirteen of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Lodger in May's Pond. Harvey Munden had settled himself in a corner of the club smoking room with a cigar and a review. At eleven o'clock on a Saturday morning in August, he might reasonably expect to be undisturbed. But, behold, there entered a boar, a long-faced man with a yellow waistcoat, much dreaded by all the members. He stood a while at one of the tables, fingering newspapers and eyeing the solitary. Harvey heard a step, looked up, and shuddered. The boar began his attack in form. Harvey parried with as much resolution as his kindly nature permitted. "'You know that Dr. Shergold is dying,' fell casually from the imperturbable man. "'Dying?' Munden was startled into attention, and the full flow of gossip swept about him. "'Yes, the great Dr. Shergold lay dying. There were bulletins in the morning papers. It seemed unlikely that he would see another dawn.' "'Who will benefit by his decease?' inquired the boar. "'His nephew, do you think?' "'Very possibly. "'A remarkable man, that. "'A most remarkable man. "'He was at Lady Teasdale's the other evening, "'and he talked a good deal. "'Upon my word, it reminded one of Coleridge or Macaulay, "'that kind of thing. "'Certainly most brilliant talk. "'I can't remember what it was all about.' something literary a sort of fantasia don't you know wonderful eloquence by the by i believe he is a great friend of yours oh we have known each other for a long time somebody was saying that he had gone in for medicine walking one of the hospitals that kind of thing yes he's at guy's to avoid infinite questioning Harvey flung aside his review and went to glance at the Times. He read the news concerning the great physician. Then, as his pursuer drew near again, he hastily departed. By midday he was at London Bridge. He crossed to the Surrey side, turned immediately to the left, and at a short distance entered one of the vaulted thoroughfares which run beneath London Bridge Station. It was like the mouth of some monstrous cavern. Out of glaring daylight he passed into gloom and chill air. On either side of the way a row of suspended lamps gave a dull yellow light, revealing entrances to vast storehouses, most of them occupied by wine merchants. An alcoholic smell prevailed over indeterminate odours of dampness. There was great concourse of drays and wagons, wheels and the clang of giant hoops made roaring echo and above thundered the trains the vaults barely illumined with gas jets seemed of infinite extent dim figures moved near and far amid huge barrels cases packages in rooms partitioned off by glass framework men sat writing a curve in the tunnel made it appear much longer than it really was till midway nothing could be seen ahead but deepening darkness then of a sudden appeared the issue and beyond greatly to the surprise of any one who should have ventured hither for the first time was a vision of magnificent plane trees golden in the august sunshine one of the abrupt contrasts which are so frequent in london and which make its charm for those who wander from the beaten tracks a transition from the clangorous cave of commerce to a sunny, leafy quietude amid old houses, some with quaint tumbling roofs and byways little frequented. The plains grow at the back of Guy's Hospital, and close by is a short, narrow street which bears the name of May's Pond. It consists for the most part of homely, flat-fronted dwellings, where lodgings are let to medical students. At one of these houses, Harvey Munden plied the knocker. He was answered by a trim, rather pert-looking girl, who smiled familiarly. "'Mr. Shergold isn't in, sir,' 
she said at once, anticipating his question. "'But he will be very soon. Will you step in and wait?' "'I think I will.' As one who knew the house, he went upstairs and entered a sitting-room on the first floor. The girl followed him. "'I haven't had time to clear away the breakfast things,' she said, speaking rapidly and with an air. "'Mr. Shergold was late this morning. He didn't get up till nearly ten, and then he sat writing letters.' "'Did he know as you was coming, sir?' "'No, I looked in on the chance of finding him, or learning where he was. "'I'm sure he'll be in about half-past twelve, "'cause he said to me as he was only going to get a breath of air. "'He hasn't nothing to do at the hospital just now. "'Has he talked of going away?' "'Going away?' the girl repeated the words sharply, "'and examined the speaker's face. "'Oh, he won't be going away just yet, I think.' London returned her look with a certain curiosity, and watched her as she began to clink together the things upon the table. Obviously she esteemed herself a person of some importance. Her figure was not bad, and her features had the trivial prettiness so commonly seen in London girls of the lower orders, the kind of prettiness which ultimately loses itself in fat and chronic perspiration, her complexion already began to show a tendency to muddiness, and when her lips parted they showed decay of teeth. In dress she was untidy. Her hair exhibited a futile attempt at elaborate arrangement. She had dirty hands. Disposed to talk, she lingered as long as possible. But Harvey Munden had no leanings to this kind of colloquy. When the girl took herself off, he drew a breath of satisfaction and smiled the smile of an intellectual man who has outlived youthful follies. He stepped over to the lodger's bookcase. There were about a hundred volumes, only a handful of them connected with medical study. Seeing a volume of his own, Munden took it down and idly turned the pages. It surprised him to discover a great many marginal notes in pencil and an examination of these showed him that Shergold must have gone carefully through the book, with an eye to the correction of its style. Adjectives were deleted and inserted, words of common usage removed for others which only a fine literary conscience could supply, and in places even the punctuation was minutely changed. Whilst he still pondered this singular manifestation of critical zeal, the door opened, and Shergold came in. A man of two-and-thirty, short, ungraceful, ill-dressed, with features as little commonplace as can be imagined. He had somewhat a stern look, and on his brow were furrows of care. Light blue eyes tended to modify the all-but-harshness of his lower face. When he smiled, as on recognizing his friend, they expressed a wonderful innocence and suavity of nature. Overshadowed, in thoughtful or troubled mood by his heavy eyebrows, they became deeply pathetic. His nose was short and flat, yet somehow not ignoble. His full lips, bare of moustache, tended to suggest a melancholy fretfulness. But for the high forehead, no casual observer would have cared to look at him a second time. But that upper story made the whole countenance vivid with intellect, as though a light beamed upon it from above. "'You hypocritical beggar!' cried Harvey, turning with the volume in his hand. "'Is this how you treat the glorious works of your contemporaries?' Shergold reddened and was mute. "'I shall take this away with me,' pursued the other, laughing. "'It'll be worth a little study.' "'My dear fellow, you won't take it ill of me. "'I didn't really mean it as criticism,' "'the deep musical voice stammered in serious embarrassment. "'Why, wasn't it just this kind of thing "'that caused a quarrel between George Sand and Musset? "'Yes, yes, but George Sand was such a peremptory fellow, "'and Musset such a vaporish young person. "'Look, I'll show you what I meant. "'Thanks.' said munden i can find that out for myself he thrust the book into his coat pocket i came to ask you if you are aware of your uncle's condition of course i am 
When did you see him last? See him? Shergold's eyes wandered vaguely. Oh, to talk with him? About a month ago. Did you part friendly? On excellent terms. And last night I went to ask after him. Unfortunately, he didn't know anyone, but the nurse said he had been mentioning my name, and in a kind way. Capital. Hadn't you better walk in that direction this afternoon? Yes, perhaps I had. And yet, you know, I hate to have it supposed that I am hovering about him. All the same, go. Shergold pointed to a chair. Sit down a bit. I have been having a talk with Dr. Salmon. He discourages me a good deal. You know, it's far from certain that I shall go on with medicine. Far from certain, the other assented, smiling. By the by, I hear that you have been in the world of late. You were at Lady Teasdale's not long ago. Well, yes. Why not? Perhaps it was partly his vexation at the book incident. Shergold seemed unable to fix his thoughts on anything. He shuffled in his seat and kept glancing nervously towards the door. I was delighted to hear it, said his friend. That's a symptom of health. Go everywhere. See everybody. That's worth seeing. They've got you to talk, I believe. Who has been telling you? I'm afraid I talked a lot of rubbish. I had shivers of shame all through a sleepless night after it. But someone brought up Whistler, and etching, and so on, and I had a few ideas of which I wanted to relieve my mind. And after all, there's a pleasure in talking to intelligent people. Henry Wilt was there, with his daughters, clever girls, by Jove, and Mrs. Peter Rain. Do you know her? Know of her, that's all. A splendid woman. Brains, brains. Upon my soul, I know no such delight as listening to a really intellectual woman, when she's also beautiful. I shake with delight. And what women one does meet nowadays. Of course, the world never saw their like. I have my idea of Aspasia, but there are lots of grander women in London today. One ought to live among the rich. What a wretched mistake, when one can help it, to herd with narrow foreheads however laudable your motive. Since I got back among the better people, my life has been trebled, oh, centupled, in value. My boy, remarked Munden quietly, didn't I say something to this effect on a certain day nine years ago? Don't talk of it, the other replied, waving his hand in agitation. We'll never look back at that. Your room is stuffy, said Munden, rising. Let us go and have lunch somewhere. Yes, we will. Just a moment to wash my hands. I've been in the dissecting room. The friends went downstairs. At the foot, they passed the landlady's daughter. She drew back, but as Shergold allowed his companion to pass into the street, her voice made itself heard behind him. Shall you want tea, Mr. Shergold? Munden turned sharply and looked at the girl. Shergold did not look at her, but he delayed for a moment and appeared to balance the question. Then, in a friendly voice, he said, No, thank you. I may not be back till late in the evening. And he went on hurriedly. Cheeky little beggar, that, Munden observed, with a glance at his friend. Oh, not a bad girl in her way. They've made me very comfortable. All the same, I shan't grieve when the day of departure comes. It was not cheerful, the life story of Henry Shergold. At two and twenty he found himself launched upon the world with a university education incomplete and about forty pounds in his pocket. A little management, a little less of boyish pride, and he might have found the means to go forward to his degree, with pleasant hopes in the background. But Henry was a radical, a scorner of privilege, a believer in human perfectibility. He got a place in an office, and he began to write poetry, some of which was published and duly left unpaid for. A year later, there came one fateful day when he announced to his friend Harvey Munden that he was going to be married. His chosen bride was the daughter of a journeyman tailor, 
a tall, pale, unhealthy girl of eighteen, whose acquaintance he had made at a tobacconist's shop, where she served. He was going to marry her on principle, principle informed with callow passion, the passion of a youth who has lived demurely more among books than men. Harvey Munden flew into a rage and called upon the gods in protest. But Shergold was not to be shaken. The girl, he declared, had fallen in love with him during conversations across the counter. Her happiness was in his hands, and he would not betray it. She had excellent dispositions. He would educate her. The friends quarrelled about it, and Shergold led home his bride with the results which any sane person could have foretold. The marriage was a hideous disaster. In three years it brought Shergold to an attempted suicide, for which he had to appear at the police court. His relative, the distinguished doctor, who had hitherto done nothing for him, now came forward with counsel and assistance. Happily, the only child of the union had died at a few weeks old, and the wife, though making noisy proclamation of rights, was so weary of her husband that she consented to a separation. But in less than a year the two were living together again. Mrs. Shergold had been led by her relatives to believe that some day the poor fellow would have his uncle's money, and her wiles ultimately overcame Shergold's resistance. He, now studying law at the doctor's expense, found himself once more abandoned and reduced to get his living as a solicitor's clerk. His uncle had bidden him good-bye on a postcard, whereon was illegibly scribbled something about damned fools. He bore the burden for three more years. Then his wife died. One night, after screaming herself speechless in fury at Shergold's refusal to go with her to a music hall, she had a fit on the stairs, and, in falling, received fatal injuries. The man was free, but terribly shattered. Only after a long sojourn abroad, at his kinsman's expense, did he begin to recover health. He came back and entered himself as a student at Guy's, greatly to Dr. Shergold's satisfaction. His fees were paid, and a small sum was allowed him to live upon, a very small sum. By degrees, some old acquaintances began to see him, but it was only quite of late that he had accepted invitations from people of social standing, whom he met at the doctor's house. The hints of his story that got about made him an interesting figure, especially to women, and his remarkable gifts were recognized as soon as circumstances began to give him fair play. All modern things were of interest to him, and his knowledge, acquired with astonishing facility, formed the fund of talk which had singular charm alike for those who did and those who did not understand it. Undeniably shy, he yet, when warmed to a subject, spoke with nerve and confidence. In days of jabber more or less impolite, this appearance of an articulate mortal with soft manners and totally unaffected could not but excite curiosity. Lady Teasdale, eager for the uncommon, chanced to observe him one evening as he conversed with his neighbour at the dinner-table. Later, in the drawing-room, she encouraged him with flattery of rapt attention to a display of his powers. She resolved to make him a feature of her evenings. Fortunately, his kindred with Dr. Shergold made a respectable introduction, and Lady Teasdale whispered it among matrons that he would inherit from the wealthy doctor, who had neither wife nor child. He might not be fair to look upon, but handsome is that handsome has. And now the doctor lay sick unto death. Society was out of town, but Lady Teasdale, with a house full of friends about her down in Hampshire, did not forget her protégé. She waited with pleasant expectation for the young man's release from poverty. It came in a day or two. Dr. Shergold was dead, and an enterprising newspaper announced simultaneously that the bulk of his estate would pass to Mr. Henry Shergold, a gentleman at present studying for his uncle's profession. 
This paragraph caught the eye of Harvey Munden, who sent a line to his friend to ask if it was true. In reply, he received a mere postcard. Yes, we'll see you before long. But Harvey wanted to be off to Como, and as business took him into the city, he crossed the river and sought May's Pond. Again the door was opened to him by the landlady's daughter. She stood looking keenly into his face, her eyes smiling and yet suspicious. "'Mr. Shergold in?' he asked carelessly. "'No, he isn't.' There was a strange bluntness about this answer. The girl stood forward as if to bar the entrance, and kept searching his face. "'When is he likely to be?' "'I don't know. He didn't say when he went out.' A woman's figure appeared in the background. The girl turned and said sharply, "'All right, mother. It's only somebody for Mr. Shergold.' "'I'll go upstairs and write a note,' said Munden, in a rather peremptory voice. The other drew back and allowed him to pass, but with evident disinclination. As he entered the room, he saw that she had followed. He went up to a side-table on which lay a blotting-book, with other requisites for writing, and then he stood for a moment, as if in meditation. "'Your name is Emma, isn't it?' he inquired, looking at the girl with a smile. "'Yes, it is.' "'Well, then, Emma, shut the door and let's have a talk. Your mother won't mind, will she?' he added slyly. The girl tossed her head. "'I don't see what it's got to do with mother.' She closed the door, but did not latch it. "'What do you want to talk about?' "'You're a very nice girl to look at, Emma, and I've always admired you when you opened the door to me. I've always liked your nice, respectful way of speaking. But somehow you don't speak quite so nicely today. What has put you out?' Her eyes did not quit his face for a moment. Her attitude betokened the utmost keenness of suspicious observation. "'Nothing's put me out that I know of. "'Yet you don't speak very nicely, not very respectfully. "'Perhaps,' he paused, "'perhaps Mr. Shergold is going to leave? "'Perhaps he may be. "'And you are vexed at losing a lodger?' "'He saw her lip curl, and then she laughed. "'You're wrong there. "'Then what is it?' "'He drew near and made as though he would advance a familiar arm. "'Emma started back. "'All right,' she exclaimed with an insolent nod. "'I'll tell Mr. Shergold.' "'Tell Mr. Shergold? Why? What has it to do with him?' "'A good deal. "'Indeed, for shame, Emma, I never expected that.' "'What do you mean?' she retorted hotly. "'You keep your impudence to yourself. "'If you want to know, Mr. Shergold is going to marry me. "'So there.' "'The stroke was effectual. "'Harry Munden stood as if transfixed, "'but he recovered himself before a word escaped his lips. "'Ah, that alters the case. "'I beg your pardon. "'You won't make trouble between old friends?' Vanity disarmed the girl's misgiving. She grinned with satisfaction. "'That depends how you behave.' "'Oh, you don't know me. But promise now not a word to Shergold.' She gave a conditional promise, and stood radiant with her triumph. "'Thanks. That's very good of you. Well, I won't trouble to leave a note. You shall just tell Shergold that I am leaving England tomorrow for a holiday.' I should like to see him, of course, and I may possibly look round this evening. If I can't manage it, just tell him that I think he ought to have given me a chance of congratulating him. May I ask, when is it to be? Emma resumed an air of prudery. Before very long, I dare say. I wish you joy. Well, I mustn't talk longer now, but I'll do my best to look in this evening, and then we can all chat together. He laughed, and she laughed back, and thereupon they parted. A little after nine that evening, when only a grey reflex of daylight lingered upon a cloudy sky, 
Munden stood beneath the plane trees at Guy's Hospital, waiting. He had walked the length of May's Pond, and had ascertained that his friend's window as yet showed no light. Shergold was probably still from home. In the late afternoon he had made inquiry at the house of the deceased doctor, but of Henry nothing was known there. He left a message for delivery, if possible, to the effect that he would call in at May's Pond between nine and ten. At a quarter past the hour there appeared from the direction of London Bridge a well-known figure, walking slowly, head bent. Munden moved forward, and on seeing him, Shergold grasped his hand feverishly. "'Ha! How glad I am to meet you, Munden! Come, let us walk this way.' He turned from May's Pond. "'I got your message up yonder an hour or two ago. So glad I have met you here, old fellow.' "'Well, your day has come,' said Harvey, trying to read his friend's features in the gloom. "'He has left me about eighty thousand pounds,' Shergold replied in a low, shaken voice. "'I'm told there are big legacies to hospitals as well. Heavens, how rich he was!' "'When is the funeral?' "'Friday.' "'Where shall you live in the meantime?' "'I don't know. I haven't thought about it.' "'I should go to some hotel, if I were you,' said Munden. "'And I have a proposal to make. "'If I wait till Saturday, will you come with me to Como?' Shergold did not at once reply. He was walking hurriedly and making rather strange movements with his head and arms. They came into the shadow of the vaulted way beneath London Bridge Station. At this hour the great tunnel was quiet, save when a train roared above. The warehouses were closed. One or two idlers, of forbidding aspect, hung about in the murky gaslight, and from the far end came a sound of children at play. "'You won't be wanted here,' Munden added. "'No, no, I think not.' There was agitation in the voice. "'Then you will come?' "'Yes, I will come.' Shergold spoke with unnecessary vehemence and laughed oddly. "'What's the matter with you?' his friend asked. "'Nothing. The change of circumstances, I suppose. Let's get on. Let us go somewhere. I can't help reproaching myself. I ought to feel or show a decent sobriety. But what was the old fellow to me? I'm grateful to him.' "'There's nothing else on your mind?' Shergold looked up, startled. "'What do you mean? Why do you ask?' They stood together in the black shadow of an interval between two lamps. After reflecting for a moment, Munden decided to speak. "'I called at your lodgings early today, and somehow I got into talk with the girl. She was cheeky, and her behaviour puzzled me. Finally, she made an incredible announcement, that you had asked her to marry you. Of course, it's a lie. To marry her? exclaimed the listener hoarsely, with an attempt at laughter. Do you think that likely, after all I have gone through? No, I certainly don't. It staggered me. But what I want to know is, can she cause trouble? "'How do I know? A girl will lie so boldly. "'She might make a scandal, I suppose, or threaten it, "'in hope of getting money out of me.' "'But is there any ground for a scandal?' demanded Harvey. "'Not the slightest, as you mean it. "'I'm glad to hear that, but she may give you trouble. "'I see the thing doesn't astonish you very much. "'No doubt you were aware of her character?' "'Yes, yes, I know it pretty well.' "'Come, let us get out of this squalid inferno. How I hate it. Have you had dinner? I don't want any. Let us go to your rooms, shall we? There'll be a hansom passing the bridge.' They walked on in silence, and when they had found a cab they drove westward, talking only of Dr. Shergold's affairs. Munden lived in the region of the squares, hard by the British Museum. He took his friend into a comfortably furnished room, the walls hidden with books and prints, and there they sat down to smoke, 
a bottle of whisky within easy reach of both. It was plain to Harvey that some mystery lay in his friend's reserve on the subject of the girl Emma. He was still anxious, but would not lead the talk to unpleasant things. Shergold drank like a thirsty man, and the whisky seemed to make him silent. Presently he fell into absolute muteness, and lay wearily back in his chair. "'The excitement has been too much for you,' Munden remarked. Shergold looked at him with a painful embarrassment in his features. Then suddenly he bent forward. "'Munden, it's I who have lied. I did ask that girl to marry me.' "'When?' "'Last night. Why?' "'Because for a moment I was insane.' They stared at each other. "'Has she any hold upon you?' Munden asked slowly. "'None whatever, except this frantic offer of mine. "'Into which she inveiled you?' "'I can't honestly say she did. "'It was entirely my own fault. "'She has never behaved loosely, or even like a schemer. "'I doubt whether she knew anything about my uncle "'until I told her last night.' He spoke rapidly in a thick voice, moving his arms in helpless protestation. His look was one of unutterable misery. "'Well,' observed Munden, "'the frenzy has at all events passed. You have the common sense to treat it as if it had never been, and really I am tempted to believe that it was literal lunacy. Last night were you drunk?' "'I had drunk nothing.' "'Listen, and I will tell you all about it. "'I am a fool about women. "'I don't know what it is. "'Certainly not a sensual or passionate nature. "'Mine is nothing of the sort. "'It's sheer sentimentality, I suppose. "'I can't be friendly with a woman "'without drifting into mawkish tenderness. "'There's the simple truth. "'If I had married happily, "'I don't think I should have been tempted "'to go about philandering.' The society of a wife I loved and respected would be sufficient. But there's that need in me, the incessant hunger for a woman's sympathy and affection. Such a hideous mistake as mine, when I married, would have made a cynic of most men. Upon me the lesson has been utterly thrown away. I mean that, though I can talk of women rationally enough with a friend, I am at their mercy when alone with them at the mercy of the silliest, vulgarest creature. After all, isn't it very much the same with men in general? The average man, how does he come to marry? Do you think he deliberately selects? Does he fall in love, in the strict sense of the phrase, with that one particular girl? No, it comes about by chance, by the drifting force of circumstances. Not one man in ten thousand, when he thinks of marriage, waits for the ideal wife, for the woman who makes capture of his soul or even of his senses. Men marry without passion. Most of us have a very small circle for choice. The hazard of everyday life throws us into contact with this girl or that, and presently we begin to feel either that we have compromised ourselves or that we might as well save trouble and settle down as soon as possible and the girl at hand will do as well as another. More often than not, it is the girl who decides for us. In more than half the marriages, it's the woman who has practically proposed. She puts herself in a man's way. With her, it rests almost entirely whether a man shall think of her as a possible wife or not. She has endless ways of putting herself forward without seeming to do so. As often as not, it's merely passivity that effects the end. She has only to remain seated instead of moving away, to listen with a smile instead of looking bored, to be at home instead of being out. And she is making love to a man. In a palace of truth, how many husbands would have to confess that it decidedly surprised them when they found themselves engaged to be married? The will comes into play only for a moment or two now and then. Of course it is made to seem responsible, and in a sense it is responsible, but in the vast majority of cases, purely as an animal instinct, confirming the suggestion of circumstances. There's something in all this, 
granted the listener, but it doesn't explain the behaviour of a man who, after a frightful experience in marriage, after recovering his freedom, after finding himself welcomed by congenial society, after inheriting a fortune to use as he likes, goes and offers himself to an artful hussy in a lodging-house. That's the special case. Look how it came to pass. Months ago I knew I was drifting into dangerous relations with that girl. Unfortunately, I am not a rascal. I can't think of girls as playthings. A fatal conscientiousness in an unmarried man of no means. Day after day we grew more familiar. She used to come up and ask me if I wanted anything, and of course I knew that she began to come more often than necessary. When she laid a meal for me, we talked, half an hour at a time. The mother, doubtless, looked on with approval. Emma had to find a husband, and why not me as well as another? They knew I was a soft creature, that I never made a row about anything, was grateful for anything that looked like kindness, and so on. Just the kind of man to be captured. But no, I don't want to make out that I am their victim. That's a feeble excuse, and a worthless one. The average man would either have treated the girl as a servant, and so kept her at distance, or else he would have alarmed her by behavior which suggested anything you like but marriage. As for me, I hadn't the common sense to take either of these courses. I made a friend of the girl, talked to her more and more confidentially, and at last, fatal moment, told her my history. Yes, I was ass enough to tell that girl the whole story of my life. Can you conceive such folly? Yet the easiest thing in the world to understand. We were alone in the house one evening. After trying to work for about an hour, I gave it up. I knew that the mother was out, and I heard Emma moving downstairs. I was lonely and dispirited, wanted to talk, to talk about myself to someone who would give a kind ear. So I went down and made some excuse for beginning a conversation in the parlor. It lasted a couple of hours. We were still talking when the mother came back. I didn't persuade myself that I cared for Emma even then. Her vulgarisms of speech and feeling jarred upon me. But she was feminine. She spoke and looked gently with sympathy. I enjoyed that evening. And you must bear in mind what I have told you before, that I stand in awe of refined women. I am their equal, I know. I can talk with them. Their society is an exquisite delight to me. But when it comes to thinking of intimacy with one of them, perhaps it is my long years of squalid existence. Perhaps I have come to regard myself as doomed to life on a lower level. I find it an impossible thing to imagine myself offering marriage, making love, to a girl such as those I meet in the big houses. You will outgrow that, said Munden. Yes, yes, I hope and believe so. And wouldn't it be criminal to deny myself even the chance, now that I have the money? All today I have been tortured like a soul that beholds its salvation lost by a moment's weakness of the flesh. You can imagine what my suffering has been. It drove me into sheer lying. I had resolved to deny utterly that I had asked Emma to marry me to deny it with a savage boldness, and take the consequences. A most rational resolve, my dear fellow. Pray stick to it. But you haven't told me yet how the dizzy culmination of your madness was reached. You say that you proposed last night? Yes, and simply for the pleasure of telling Emma, when she had accepted me, that I had eighty thousand pounds. You can't understand that? I suppose the change of fortune has made me a little light-headed. I have been going about with a sense of exultation which has prompted me to endless follies. I have felt a desire to be kind to people, to bestow happiness, to share my joy with others. If I had some of the doctor's money in my pocket, I should have given away five-pound notes. You contented yourself, said Munden, laughing, 
with giving a promissory note for the whole legacy. Yes, but try to understand. Emma came up to my room at supper time, and as usual we talked. I didn't say anything about my uncle's death. Yet I felt the necessity of telling her creep fatally upon me. There was a conflict in my mind between common sense and that awful sentimentality which is my curse. When Emma came up again after supper, she mentioned that her mother was gone with a friend to the theatre. "'Why don't you go?' I said. "'Oh, I don't go anywhere. But after all,' I urged consolingly, "'August isn't exactly the time for enjoying the theatre. She admitted it wasn't, but there was the exhibition at Earl's Court she had heard so much of and wanted to go. Then suppose we go together one of these evenings.' "'You see? Idiot. And I couldn't help it. "'My tongue spoke these imbecile words in spite of my brain. "'All very well if I had meant what another man would, but I didn't. "'And the girl knew I didn't. "'And she looked at me, and then, why, mere brute instinct did the rest. "'No, not mere instinct, for it was complicated with that idiot desire "'to see how the girl would look.' hear what she would say when she knew that I had given her eighty thousand pounds. You can't understand? As a bit of morbid psychology, yes. And the frantic proceeding made me happy. For an hour or two I behaved as if I loved the girl with all my soul. And afterwards I was still happy. I walked up and down my bedroom, making plans for the future, for her education, and so on. I saw all sorts of admirable womanly qualities in her. I was in love with her, and there's an end of it. Munden mused for a while, then laid down his pipe. Remarkably suggestive, Shergold, the name of the street in which you have been living. Well, why don't you go back there? No, I have come to my senses. I shall go to an hotel for tonight, and send presently for my things. To be sure, and on Saturday, or on Friday evening, if you like, we leave England. It was evident that Shergold rejoiced with trembling. But I can't stick to that lie, he said. I shall compensate the girl. You see, by running away I make confession that there's something wrong. I shall see a solicitor, and put the matter into his hands. As you please, but let the solicitor exercise his own discretion as to damages. Damages, Shergold pondered the word. I suppose she won't drag me into court, make a public ridicule of me? If so, there's an end of my hopes. I couldn't go among people after that. I don't see why not, but your solicitor will probably manage the affair. They have their methods, Munden added dryly. Early the next morning, Shergold dispatched a telegram to May's Pond, addressed to his landlady. It said that he would be kept away by business for a day or two. On Friday he attended his uncle's funeral, and that evening he left Charing Cross with Harry Munden en route for Como. There, a fortnight later, Shergold received from his solicitor a communication which put an end to his feigning of repose and hopefulness. That he did but feign, Harvey Munden felt assured. Signs of a troubled conscience, or at all events of restless nerves, were evident in all his doing and conversing. Now he once more made frank revelation of his weakness. "'There's the devil to pay. She won't take money. She's got a lawyer, and is going to bring me into court. I've authorized Reckitt to offer as much as five thousand pounds. It's no good. He says her lawyer has evidently encouraged her to hope for enormous damages, and then she'll have the satisfaction of making me the town talk. It's all up with me, Munden. My hopes are vanished like—what is it in Dante?' in fumo in aere and in aqua la ciuma. Smoking the cavour, Munden lay back in the shadow of the pergola, and seemed to disdain reply. Your advice? 
What's the good of advising a man born to be fooled? Why let the blank do her worst? Shergold winced. We mustn't forget that it's all my fault. Yes, just as it's your own fault, you didn't die on the day of your birth. I must raise the offer. By all means, offer ten thousand. I suppose a jury would give her two hundred and fifty. But the scandal, the ridicule. Face it. Very likely it's the only thing that would teach you wisdom and save your life. That's one way of looking at it. I half believe it might be effectual. He kept alone for most of the day. In the evening, from nine to ten, he went upon the lake with Harvey, but could not talk. His blue eyes were sunk in a restless melancholy. His brows were furrowed. He kept making short, nervous movements, as though in silent remonstrance with himself. And when the next morning came, and Harvey Munden rang the bell for his coffee, a waiter brought him a note addressed in Shergold's hand. "'I have started for London,' ran the hurriedly written lines. "'Don't be uneasy. All I mean to do is stop the danger of a degrading publicity.' The fear of that is too much for me. I have an idea, and you shall hear how I get on in a few days. The nature of that promising idea Munden never learnt. His next letter from Shergold came in about ten days. It informed him very briefly that the writer was about to be married, and that in less than a week he would have started with his wife on a voyage round the world. Harvey did not reply. Indeed, the letter contained no address. One day in November he was accosted at the club by his familiar bore. So, your friend Shergold is dead. Dead? I know nothing of it. Really, they talked of it last night at Lady Teasdale's. He died a few days ago at Calcutta. Dysentery or something of that kind. His wife cabled to someone or other. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Salt of the Earth. Strong and silent, the tide of Thames flowed upward, and over it swept the morning tide of humanity. Through white autumnal mist, yellow sunbeams flitted from shore to shore. The dome, the spires, the river frontages slowly unveiled and brightened. There was hope of a fair day. Not that it much concerned this throng of men and women hastening to their labour. From near and far, by the league-long highways of South London, hither they converged each morning, and joined the procession across the bridge. Their task was the same today as yesterday, regardless of gleam or gloom. Many had walked such a distance that they plodded wearily, looking neither to right nor left. The more vigorous strode briskly on, elbowing their way or nimbly skipping into the road to gain advance. Yet these also had a fixed gaze, preoccupied or vacant, seldom cheerful. Here and there a couple of friends conversed. Girls with bag or parcel and a book for the dinner hour chattered and laughed. But for the most part lips were mute amid the clang and roar of heavy-laden wheels. It was the march of those who combat hunger with delicate hands, at the pen's point, or from behind the breastwork of a counter, or trusting to bare wits pressed daily on the grindstone. Their chief advantage over the sinewy class beneath them lay in the privilege of spending more than they could afford on house and clothing. With rare exceptions, they had no hope, no chance of reaching independence. Enough if they upheld the threadbare standard of respectability and bequeathed it to their children as a solitary heirloom. 
the oldest looked the poorest and naturally so amid the tramp of multiplying feet their steps had begun to lag when speed was more than ever necessary they saw newcomers outstrip them and trudged under an increasing load no eye surveying this procession would have paused for a moment on thomas bird in costume there was nothing to distinguish him from hundreds of rather shabby clerks who passed along with their out-of-fashion chimney-pot and badly rolled umbrella his gait was that of a man who takes no exercise beyond the daily walk to and from his desk the casual glance could see nothing in his features but patient dullness tending to good humour he might be thirty he might be forty impossible to decide yet when a ray of sunshine fell upon him and he lifted his eyes to the eastward promise there shone in his countenance something one might vainly have sought through the streaming concourse of which thomas bird was an unregarded atom for him it appeared the struggling sunlight had a message of hope trouble cleared from his face he smiled unconsciously and quickened his steps for fifteen years he had walked to and fro over blackfriars bridge leaving his home in camberwell at eight o'clock and reaching it again at seven fate made him a commercial clerk as his father before him he earned more than enough for his necessities but seemed to have reached the limit of promotion for he had no influential friends and he lacked the capacity to rise by his own efforts there may have been some calling for which thomas was exactly suited but he did not know of it in the office he proved himself a trustworthy machine with no opportunity of becoming anything else his parents were dead his kindred scattered he lived as for several years past in lodgings but it never occurred to him to think of his lot as mournful a man of sociable instincts he had many acquaintances some of whom he cherished an extreme simplicity marked his tastes and the same characteristic appeared in his conversation an easy man to deceive easy to make fun of yet impossible to dislike or despise unless by the despicable he delighted in stories of adventure of bravery by flood or field and might have posed had he ever posed at all as something of an authority on north pole expeditions and the geography of polynesia he received his salary once a month and to-day was payday the consciousness of having earned a certain number of sovereigns always set his thoughts on possible purchases and at present he was revolving the subject of his wardrobe certainly it needed renewal but thomas could not decide at which end to begin head or feet his position in a leading house demanded a good hat the bad weather called for new boots living economically as he did it should have been a simple matter to resolve the doubt by purchasing both articles but for one reason and another thomas seldom had a surplus over the expenses of his lodgings in practice he found it very difficult to save a sovereign for other needs when evening released him he walked away in a cheerful frame of mind grasping the money in his trousers pocket and all but decided to make some acquisition on the way home near ludgate circus some one addressed him over his shoulder good evening tom pleasant for the time of year the speaker was a man of fifty stout and florid the latter peculiarity especially marked in his nose he looked like a substantial merchant and spoke with rather pompous geniality thrusting his arm through the clerks he walked with him over blackfriars bridge talking in the friendliest strain of things impersonal beyond the bridge do you tram it he asked glancing upwards i think so mr warbeck answered the other whose tone to his acquaintance was very respectful ah i'm afraid it would make me late oh by the by tom i'm really ashamed most awkward that this kind of thing happens so often but could you do you think 
no no one sovereign only let me make a note of it by the light of this shop window really the total is getting quite considerable tut tut you shall have a cheque in a day or two oh it can't run on any longer i'm completely ashamed of myself entirely temporary as i explained a cheque on wednesday at latest good-bye tom they shook hands cordially and mr warbeck went off in a hansom thomas bird changing his mind about the tram walked all the way home and with bent head one would have thought that he had just done something discreditable he was wondering not for the first time whether mrs warbeck knew or suspected that her husband was in debt to him miss warbeck alma warbeck assuredly had never dreamed of such a thing the system of casual loans dated from nearly twelve months ago and the total was now not much less than thirty pounds mr warbeck never failed to declare that he was ashamed of himself but probably the creditor experienced more discomfort of that kind at the first playful demand thomas felt a shock he had known the warbecks since he was a lad had always respected them as somewhat his social superiors and as time went on had recognized that the difference of position grew wider he remaining stationary while his friends progressed to a larger way of living but they were he thought no less kind to him mrs warbeck invited him to the house about once a month and alma alma talked with him in such a pleasant homely way did their expenditure outrun their means he would never have supposed it but for the city man's singular behaviour about the check so often promised he cared little but with all his heart he hoped mrs warbeck did not know somewhere near camberwell green just as he had resumed the debate about his purchases a middle-aged woman met him with friendly greeting her appearance was that of a decent shopkeeper's wife i'm so glad i've met you mr bird i know you'll be anxious to hear how our poor friend is getting on she spoke of the daughter of a decayed tradesman a weak and overworked girl who had lain for some weeks in st thomas's hospital mrs pritchard a gadabout infected with philanthropy was fond of discovering such cases and in everyday conversation made the most of her charitable efforts they'll allow her out in another week she pursued but of course she can't expect to be fit for anything for a time and i very much doubt whether she'll ever get the right use of her limbs again but what we have to think of now is to get her some decent clothing the poor thing has positively nothing i'm going to speak to mrs doubleday and a few other people really mr bird if it weren't that i've presumed on your good nature so often lately she paused and smiled unctuously at him i'm afraid i can't do much faltered thomas reddening at the vision of a new chimney-pot no no of course not i'm sure i should never expect it's only that every little however little does help you know thomas thrust a hand into his pocket and brought out a florin which mrs pritchard pursed with effusive thanks certain of this good woman's critics doubted her competence as a trustee but thomas bird had no such misgiving he talked with kindly interest of the unfortunate girl and wished her well in a voice that carried conviction his lodgings were a pair of very small mouldy and ill-furnished rooms he took them unwillingly overcome by the landlady's doleful story of their long lodgerless condition and in the exercise of a heavenly forbearance remained year after year the woman did not cheat him and thomas knew enough of life to respect her for this remarkable honesty she was simply an ailing lachrymose slut incapable of effort her son a lad who had failed in several employments from sheer feebleness of mind and body practically owed his subsistence to thomas bird whose good offices had at length established the poor fellow at a hairdresser's to sit frequently for an hour at a time as thomas did listening with attention to mrs batty's talk of her own and her son's ailments was in itself a marvel of charity 
This evening she met him as he entered, and lighted him into his room. "'There's a letter come for you, Mr. Bird. I put it down somewheres. Why, now, where did I? Oh, here it is. You'll be glad to hear as Sam did his first shave today, and his hand didn't tremble much neither.' Burning with desire to open the letter, which he saw was from Mrs. Warbeck, Thomas stood patiently until the flow of words began to gurgle away amid groans and pantings. Well, he cried gaily, didn't I promise Sam a shilling when he'd done his first shave? If I didn't, I ought to have, and here it is for him. Then he hurried into the bedroom and read his letter by candlelight. It was a short scrawl on thin, scented, pink-hued notepaper. Would he do Mrs. Warbeck the favour of looking in before ten to-night? No explanation of this unusually worded request, and Thomas fell at once into a tremor of anxiety. With a hurried glance at his watch, he began to make ready for the visit, struggling with drawers which would neither open nor shut, and driven to despair by the damp condition of his clean linen. In this room, locked away from all eyes but his own, lay certain relics which Thomas worshipped. One was a photograph of a girl of fifteen. At that age, Alma Warbeck promised little charm, and the photograph allowed her less but it was then that Thomas Bird became her bondman, as he had ever since remained. There was also a letter, the only one that he had ever received from her. Dear Mr. Bird, Mamma says will you buy her some more of those jujubes at the shop in the city and bring them on Saturday. Yours sincerely, Alma Warbeck. Written when she was sixteen, seven years ago, Moreover, there was a playbill used by Alma on the single occasion when he accompanied the family to a theatre. Never had he dared to breathe a syllable of what he thought, hoped would misrepresent him, for Thomas in this matter had always stifled hope. Indeed, hope would have been irrational. In the course of her teens, Alma grew tall and well-proportioned, not beautiful of feature, but pleasing, not brilliant in personality, but good-natured, fairly intelligent and moderately ambitious. She was the only daughter of a dubiously active commission agent, and must deem it good fortune if she married a man with three or four hundred a year. But Thomas Bird had no more than his twelve pounds a month, and did not venture to call himself a gentleman. In Alma he found the essentials of true ladyhood, perhaps with reason. He had never heard her say an ill-natured thing, nor seen upon her face a look which pained his acute sensibilities. She was unpretentious, of equal temper, nothing of a gossip, kindly disposed. Never for a moment had he flattered himself that Alma perceived his devotion or cared for him otherwise than as for an old friend. But thought is free, and so is love. The modest clerk had made this girl the light of his life, and whether far or near, the rays of that ideal would guide him on his unworldly path. New-shaven and freshly clad, he set out for the Warbeck's house, which was in a near part of Brixton, not an imposing house by any means, but an object of reverence to Thomas Bird. A servant whom he did not recognize, servants came and went at the Warbeck's, admitted him to the drawing-room which was vacant there his eyes wandering about the jim crack furniture which he never found in the same arrangement at two successive visits he waited till his hostess came in mrs warbeck was very stout very plain and rather untidy yet her countenance made an impression not on the whole disagreeable with her wide eyes slightly parted lips her homely smile and unadorned speech, she counteracted in some measure the effect, upon a critical observer, of the pretentious ugliness with which she was surrounded. Thomas thought her a straightforward woman, and perhaps was not misled by his partiality. Certainly the tone in which she now began, and the tenor of her remarks, repelled suspicion of duplicity. "'Well, now, Mr. Thomas,' 
I wish to have a talk. She had thus styled him since he grew too old to be called Tom, that is to say, since he was seventeen. He was now thirty-one. And I'm going to talk to you just like the old friends we are, you see? No nonsense, no beating about the bush. You'd rather have it so, wouldn't you? Scarce able to articulate, the visitor showed a cheery assent. Yes, I was sure of that. Now, better come to the point at once. My daughter is... Well, no, she isn't yet, but the fact is, I feel sure she'll very soon be engaged. The blow was softened by Thomas's relief at discovering that money would not be the subject of their talk, yet it fell upon him, and he winced. "'You've expected it,' pursued the lady with bluff good humour. "'Yes, of course you have.' She said, "'Ave,' a weakness happily unshared by her daughter. "'We don't want it talked about, but I know you can hold your tongue. Well, it's young Mr. Fisher of Noakes, Fisher and Company. We haven't known him long, but he took from the first to Alma, and I have my reasons for believing that the feeling is mutual, though I wouldn't for the world let Alma hear me say so. Young Mr. Fisher. Thomas knew of him. A capable business man, a son of a worthy father, he kept his teeth close, his eyes down. And now, pursued Mrs. Warbeck, becoming still more genial, I'm getting round to the unpleasant side of the talk, though I don't see that it need be unpleasant. We are old friends, and where's the use of being friendly if you can't speak your mind when speak you must? It comes to this. I just want to ask you quite straightforward not to be offended or take it ill if we don't ask you to come here till this business is over and settled. You see? The fact is, we've told Mr. Fisher he can look in whenever he likes and it might happen, you know, that he'd meet you here, and, speaking like old friends, I think it better not. A fire burned in the listener's cheeks. A noise buzzed in his ears. He understood the motive of this frank request. Humble as ever, never humbler than when beneath this roof, he was ready to avow himself Mr. Fisher's inferior but with all his heart he wished that Mrs. Warbeck had found some other way of holding him aloof from her prospective son-in-law. "'Of course,' continued the woman stolidly, "'Alma doesn't know I'm saying this. It's just between our two selves. I haven't even spoken of it to Mr. Warbeck. I'm quite sure that you'll understand that we are obliged to make a few changes in the way we've lived.' It's all very well for you and me to be comfortable together and laugh and talk about all sorts of things, but with one like Alma in the house, the friends she's making and the company that's like to come here, now you do see what I mean, don't you now? And you won't take it in the wrong way? No, I was sure you wouldn't. There now, we'll shake hands over it and be as good friends as ever. The handshaking was metaphorical merely. Thomas smiled and was endeavouring to shape a sentence when he heard voices out in the hall. "'There's Alma and her father back,' said Mrs. Warbeck. "'I didn't think they'd come back so soon. They've been with some new friends of ours.' Thomas jumped up. "'I can't—I'd rather not see them, please, Mrs. Warbeck. Can you prevent it?' His voice startled her somewhat, and she hesitated. A gesture of entreaty sent her from the room. As the door opened, Alma was heard laughing merrily. Then came silence. In a minute or two the hostess returned, and the visitor, faltering, "'Thank you, I quite understand,' quietly left the house. For three weeks he crossed and recrossed Blackfriars Bridge without meeting Mr. Warbeck. His look was perhaps graver, his movements less alert, but he had not noticeably changed. His life kept its wonted tenor. The florid-nosed gentleman at length came face to face with him on Ludgate Hill in the dinner hour, an embarrassment to both. Speedily recovering self-possession, Mr. Warbeck pressed the clerk's hand with fervour and drew him aside. "'I've been wanting to see you, Tom. So you keep away from us, do you? I understand.' The old lady has given me a quiet hint. Well, well, you're quite right, and I honour you for it, Tom. 
Nothing selfish about you. You keep it all to yourself. I honour you for it, my dear boy. And perhaps I had better tell you, Alma is to be married in January. After that, same as before, won't it be? Have a glass of wine with me? No time? We must have a quiet dinner together some evening, one of the old chop-houses. There was something else I wanted to speak about, but I see you're in a hurry. All right, it'll do next time. He waved his hand and was gone. When next they encountered, Mr. Warbeck made bold to borrow ten shillings, without the most distant allusion to his outstanding debt. Thomas Bird found comfort in the assurance that Mrs. Warbeck had kept her secret as the borrower kept his. Alma's father was not utterly dishonoured in his sight. One day in January, Thomas, pleading indisposition, left work at twelve. He had a cold and a headache, and felt more miserable than at any time since his school days. As he rode home in an omnibus, Mr. and Mrs. Warbeck were entertaining friends at the wedding breakfast, and Thomas knew it. For an hour or two in the afternoon he sat patiently under his landlady's talk, but a fit of nervous exasperation at length drove him forth, and he did not return till supper-time. Just as he sat down to a basin of gruel, Mrs. Batty admitted a boy who brought him a message. "'Mother sent me round, Mr. Bird,' said the messenger, "'and she wants to know if you could just come and see her. "'It's something about father. "'He had some work to do, but he hasn't come home to do it.' Without speaking, Thomas equipped himself and walked a quarter of a mile to the lodgings of a married friend of his, a clerk chronically out of work and too often in liquor. The wife received him with tears. After eight weeks without earning a penny, her husband had obtained the job of addressing five hundred envelopes, to be done at home and speedily. Tempted forth by an acquaintance for half a minute, as he sat down to the task, he had been absent for three hours, and would certainly return unfit for work. "'It isn't only the money,' sobbed his wife. "'But it might have got him more work, and now, of course, he's lost the chance, "'and we haven't nothing more than a crust of bread left, and—' "'Thomas slipped a half-crown into her hand and whispered, "'Send Jack before the shops close.' "'Then, to escape thanks, he shouted out, "'Where's these blessed envelopes, and where's the addresses? "'All right, just leave me this corner of the table, "'and don't speak to me as long as I sit here.' Between half-past nine and half-past twelve, at the rate of eighty an hour, he addressed all but half the five hundred envelopes. Then his friend appeared, dolefully drunk. Thomas would not look at him. "'He'll finish the rest by dinner tomorrow,' said the miserable wife, "'and that's in time.' So Thomas Bird went home. He felt better at heart, and blamed himself for his weakness during the day. He blamed himself often enough for this or that, knowing not that such as he are the salt of the earth. End of chapter 14、Chapter、15 of The House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE PIG AND WHISTLE I possess a capital of thirty thousand pounds. One third of this is invested in railway shares, which bear interest at three and a half per cent. Another third is in government stock and produces two and three quarters per cent. The rest is lent on mortgages at three per cent. Calculate my income for the present year. This kind of problem was constantly being given out by Mr. Ruddiman, assistant master at Longmeadows School. Mr. Ruddiman, who had reached the age of five-and-forty, and who never in his life had possessed five-and-forty pounds, used his arithmetic lesson as an opportunity for flight of imagination. When dictating a sum in which he attributed to himself enormous wealth, his eyes twinkled. His slender bodies struck a dignified attitude, and he smiled over the class with a certain genial condescension. 
when the calculation proposed did not refer to personal income, it generally illustrated the wealth of the nation in which Mr. Reddiman had a proud delight. He would bid his youngsters compute the proceedings of some familiar tax, and the vast sum it represented rolled from his lips on a note of extraordinary satisfaction, as if he gloried in this evidence of national prosperity. His salary at Longmeadows just sufficed to keep him decently clad and to support him during the holidays. He had been a master here for seven years, and earnestly hoped that his services might be retained for at least seven more. There was very little chance of his ever obtaining a better position, and the thought of being cast adrift, of having to betake himself to the school agencies and enter upon new engagements, gave Mr. Ruddiman a very unpleasant sensation. In his time he had gone through hardships, such as naturally befall a teacher without diplomas and possessed of no remarkable gifts. That he had never broken down in health was the result of an admirable constitution and of much native cheerfulness. Only at such an establishment as Longmeadows, an old-fashioned commercial academy, recommended to parents by the healthiness of its rural situation, could he have hoped to hold his ground against modern educational tendencies, which aim at obliterating Mr. Ruddiman and all his kind. Everyone liked him. Impossible not to like a man so abounding in kindliness and good humour. But his knowledge was anything but extensive, and his methods in instruction had a fine flavour of antiquity. Now and then Mr. Ruddiman asked himself what was to become of him when sickness or old age forbade his earning even the modest income upon which he could at present count. But his happy temper dismissed the troublesome reflection. One thing, however, he had decided. In future he would find some more economical way of spending his holidays. Hitherto he had been guilty of the extravagance of taking long journeys to see members of his scattered family or of going to the seaside, or of amusing himself, oh, how innocently, in London. This kind of thing must really stop. In the coming summer vacation he had determined to save at least five sovereigns, and he fancied he had discovered a simple way of doing it. On pleasant afternoons, when he was off duty, Mr. Ruddiman liked to have a long ramble by himself about the fields and lanes. In solitude he was never dull. Had you met him during one of these afternoon walks, more likely than not you would have seen a gentle smile on his visage as he walked with head bent. Not that his thoughts were definitely of agreeable things. Consciously he thought perhaps of nothing at all. But he liked the sunshine and country quiet, and the sense of momentary independence. Everyone would have known him for what he was. His dress, his gait, his countenance, declared the undermaster. Mr. Reddiman never carried a walking-stick. That would have seemed to him to be arrogating a social position to which he had no claim. Generally he held his hands together behind him. If not so, one of them would dip its fingers into a waistcoat pocket, and the other grasp the lapel of his coat. If anything, he looked rather less than his age, a result, perhaps, of having always lived with the young. His features were agreeably insignificant. His body, though slight of build, had something of athletic outline, due to long practice at cricket, football, and hockey. If he had rather more time than usual at his disposal, he walked as far as the pig and whistle a picturesque little wayside inn which stood alone at more than a mile from the nearest village. To reach the pig and whistle one climbed a long, slow ascent, and in warm weather few pedestrians, or for that matter folks driving or riding, could resist the suggestion of the ivy-shadowed porch which admitted to the quaint parlour. So long was it since the swinging sign had been painted that neither of pig nor of whistle was any trace now discoverable. But over the porch one read clearly enough the landlord's name, William Fouracres. Only three years ago had Mr. Fouracres established himself here. 
Ruddyman remembered his predecessor, with whom he had often chatted whilst drinking his modest bottle of ginger beer. The present landlord was a very different sort of man, less affable, not disposed to show himself to every comer. Customers were generally served by the landlord's daughter, and with her Mr. Ruddyman had come to be on very pleasant terms. But as this remark may easily convey a false impression, it must be added that Miss Sporeacres was a very discreet, well-spoken, deliberate person, of at least two and thirty. Mr. Ruddyman had known her for more than a year before anything save brief civilities passed between them. In the second twelve months of their acquaintance, they reached the point of exchanging reminiscences as to the weather, discussing the agricultural prospects of the county, and remarking on the advantage to rural innkeepers of the fashion of bicycling. In the third year they were quite intimate, so intimate, indeed, that when Mr. Foracres chanced to be absent they spoke of his remarkable history. For the landlord of the Pig and Whistle had a history worth talking about, and Mr. Ruddyman had learnt it from the landlord's own lips. Miss Foracres would never have touched upon the subject with any one in whom she did not feel confidence. To her it was far from agreeable, and Mr. Ruddyman established himself in her esteem by taking the same view of the matter. Well, one July afternoon, when the summer vacation drew near, the undermaster perspired up the sunny road with another object than that of refreshing himself at the familiar little inn. He entered by the ivy porch, and within, as usual, found Miss Foracres, who sat behind the bar sewing. Miss Foracres wore a long white apron, which protected her dress from neck to feet, and gave her an appearance of great neatness and coolness. She had a fresh complexion, and features which made no disagreeable impression. At sight of the visitor she rose, and, as her habit was, stood with one hand touching her chin whilst she smiled the discreetest of modest welcomes. "'Good day, Miss Foracres,' said the undermaster, after his usual little cough. "'Good day, sir,' was the reply, in a country voice which had a peculiar note of honesty. Miss Foracres had never yet learnt her acquaintance's name. "'Splendid weather for the crops. I'll take a ginger beer, if you please.' "'Indeed, that it is, sir. Ginger beer. Yes, sir.' then followed two or three minutes of silence. Miss Foracres had resumed her sewing, though not her seat. Mr. Ruddyman sipped his beverage more gravely than usual. "'How is Mr. Foracres?' he asked at length. "'I'm sorry to say, sir,' was the subdued reply, "'that he's thinking about the prince.' "'Oh, dear,' sighed Mr. Ruddyman, as one for whom this mysterious answer had distressing significance. "'That's a great pity.' "'Yes, sir, and I'm sorry to say,' went on Miss Foracres, in the same confidential tone, "'that the Prince is coming here. I don't mean here, sir, to the Pig and Whistle, but to Woodbury Manor. Father saw it in the newspaper, and since then he's had no rest, day or night. He's sitting out in the garden. I don't know whether you'd like to go and speak to him, sir?' "'I will, yes, I certainly will.' "'But there's something I should like to ask you about first, Miss Foracres. "'I'm thinking of staying in this part of the country through the holidays.' "'Long ago he had made known his position. "'And it has struck me that perhaps I could lodge here. "'Could you let me have a room? "'Just a bedroom would be enough.' "'Why, yes, sir,' replied the landlord's daughter. "'We have two bedrooms, you know, "'and I've no doubt my father would be willing to arrange with you.' "'Ah, then I'll mention it to him. Is he in very low spirits?' "'He's unusual low today, sir. I shouldn't wonder if it did him good to see you and talk of it.' Having finished his ginger beer, Mr. Ruddyman walked through the house and passed out into the garden, where he at once became aware of Mr. Foracres. The landlord, a man of sixty, with grizzled hair and large, heavy countenance, sat in a rustic chair under an apple-tree. Beside him was a little table, on which stood a bottle of whisky and a glass. 
approaching, Mr. Reddiman saw reason to suspect that the landlord had partaken too freely of the refreshment ready to his hand. Mr. Foraker's person was in a limp state, his cheeks were very highly coloured, and his head kept nodding as he muttered to himself. At the visitor's greeting he looked up with a sudden surprise, as though he resented an intrusion on his privacy. "'It's very hot, Mr. Foraker's,' the undermaster went on to remark with cordiality. "'Hot. I dare say it is,' replied the landlord severely. "'And what else do you expect at this time of year, sir?' "'Just so, Mr. Foraker's, just so,' said the other, as good-humouredly as possible. "'You don't find it unpleasant?' "'Why should I, sir? It was a good deal hotter day than this when His Royal Highness called upon me. A good deal hotter. The Prince didn't complain, not he. He said to me, I'm speaking of His Royal Highness, you understand. I hope you understand that, sir?' "'Oh, perfectly.' His words were, "'Very seasonable weather, Mr. Foraker's. "'I'm not likely to forget what he said, "'so it's no use you or anyone else trying to make out "'that he didn't say that. "'I tell you he did. "'Very season weather, Mr. Foraker's, "'Calling me by name just like that, "'and it's no good you nor anybody else.' The effort of repeating the prince's utterance with what was meant to be a princely accent proved so exhausting to Mr. Foraker's that he sank together in his chair and lost all power of coherent speech. In a moment he seemed to be sleeping. Having watched him a little while, Mr. Ruddiman spoke his name and tried to attract his attention. Finding it useless, he went back into the inn. "'I'm afraid I shall have to put it off to another day,' was his remark to the landlord's daughter. "'Mr. Foraker's is rather drowsy.' "'Ah, sir,' sighed the young woman, "'I'm sorry to say he's often been like that lately.' Their eyes met, but only for an instant. Mr. Reddiman looked and felt uncomfortable. "'I'll come again very soon, Miss Foraker's,' he said. "'You might just speak to your father about the room.' "'Thank you, sir. I will, sir.' And, with another uneasy glance, which was not returned, the undermaster went his way. Descending towards Long Meadows, he thought over the innkeeper's story, which may be briefly related. Some ten years before this, Mr. Foraker's occupied a very comfortable position. He was landlord of a flourishing inn, called an hotel, in a little town of some importance as an agricultural centre, and seemed perfectly content with the life and the society natural to a man so circumstanced. His manners were marked by a certain touch of pompousness, and he liked to dwell upon the excellence of the entertainment which his house afforded, but these were innocent characteristics which did not interfere with his reputation as a sensible and sound man of business. It happened one day that two gentlemen on horseback, evidently riding for their pleasure, stopped at the inn door, and, after a few inquiries, announced that they would alight and have lunch. Mr. Foraker's, who himself received these gentlemen, regarded one of them with much curiosity, and presently came to the startling conclusion that he was about to entertain no less a person than the heir apparent. He knew that the prince was then staying at a great house some ten miles away, and there could be no doubt that one of his guests had a strong resemblance to the familiar portraits of his royal highness. In his excitement at the supposed discovery, Mr. Foraker's at once communicated it to those about him, and in a very few minutes half the town had heard the news. Of course the host would allow no one but himself to wait at the royal table, which was spread in the inn's best room, guarded against all intrusion, in vain, however, did he listen for a word from either of the gentlemen which might confirm his belief. In their conversation no name or title was used, and no mention made of anything significant. They remained for an hour. When their horses were brought round for them, a considerable crowd had gathered before the hotel, and the visitors departed amid a demonstration of exuberant loyalty. On the following day, one or two persons who had been present at this scene 
declared that the two gentlemen showed surprise, and that, though both raised their hats in acknowledgment of the attention they received, they rode away laughing. For the morrow brought doubts. People began to say that the prince had never been near the town at all, and that evidence could be produced of his having passed the whole day at the house where he was a visitor. Mr. Foraker's smile disdainfully. No assertion or argument availed to shake his proud assurance that he had entertained the heir to the throne. From that day he knew no peace. Fired with an extraordinary arrogance, he viewed as his enemy every one who refused to believe in the prince's visit. He quarrelled violently with many of his best friends. He brought insulting accusations against all manner of persons. Before long, the man was honestly convinced that there existed a conspiracy to rob him of a distinction that was his due. Political animus had perhaps something to do with it, for the liberal newspaper, Mr. Foraker's was a stout conservative, made more than one malicious joke on the subject. A few townsmen stood by the landlord's side and used their ingenuity in discovering plausible reasons why the prince did not care to have it publicly proclaimed that he had visited the town and lunched at the hotel. These partisans scorned the suggestion that Mr. Foraker's had made a mistake, but they were unable to deny that a letter, addressed to the prince himself, with a view to putting an end to the debate, had elicited, in a secretarial hand, a brief denial of the landlord's story. Evidently, something very mysterious underlay the whole affair, and there was much shaking of heads for a long time. To Mr. Foraker's, the result of the honour he so strenuously vindicated was serious indeed. By way of defiance to all mockers, he wished to change the time-honoured sign of the inn, and to substitute for it the Prince of Wales' feathers. On this point, he came into conflict with the owner of the property and, having behaved very violently, received notice that his lease, just expiring, would not be renewed. Whereupon, what should Mr. Foraker's do but purchase land and begin to build for himself an hotel twice as large as that he must shortly quit? On this venture he used all, and more than all, his means, and, as every one had prophesied, he was soon a ruined man. In less than three years from the fatal day, he turned his back upon the town where he had known respect and prosperity, and went forth to earn his living as best he could. After troublous wanderings, on which he was accompanied by his daughter, faithful and devoted, though she had her doubts on a certain subject, the decayed publican at length found a place of rest. A small legacy from a relative had put it in his power to make a new, though humble, beginning in business. He established himself at the pig and whistle. The condition in which he had to-day been discovered by Mr. Ruddyman was not habitual with him. Once a month, perhaps, his melancholy thoughts drove him to the bottle. For the most part, he led a sullen, brooding life, indifferent to the state of his affairs, and only animated when he found a new and appreciative listener to the story of his wrongs. That he had been grievously wronged was Mr. Foraker's immutable conviction. Not by his royal highness, the prince knew nothing of the strange conspiracy which had resulted in Foraker's ruin. Letters addressed to his royal highness were evidently intercepted by underlings, and never came before the royal eyes. Again and again had Mr. Foraker's written long statements of his case and petitioned for an audience. He was now resolved to adopt other methods. He would use the first opportunity of approaching the prince's person and lifting up his voice where he could not but be heard. He sought no vulgar gain. His only desire was to have this fact recognized, that he had, indeed, entertained the prince and so put to shame all his scornful enemies. And now the desired occasion offered itself. In the month of September His Royal Highness would be a guest at Woodbury Manor, distant only some couple of miles from the pig and whistle. 
It was the excitement of such a prospect which had led Mr. Foraker's to undo indulgence under the apple tree this afternoon. A week later, Mr. Reddiman again ascended the hill, and, after listening patiently to the narrative which he had heard fifty times, came to an arrangement with Mr. Foraker's about the room he wished to rent for the holidays. The terms were very moderate, and the undermaster congratulated himself on this prudent step. He felt sure that a couple of months at the Pig and Whistle would be anything but disagreeable. The situation was high and healthy, the surroundings were picturesque, and for society, well, there was Miss Fouracres, whom Mr. Reddiman regarded as a very sensible and pleasant person. Of course, no one at Longmeadows had an inkling of the undermaster's intention. On the day of breaking up, he sent his luggage, as usual, to the nearest railway station, and that same evening had it conveyed by carrier to the little wayside inn, where, much at ease in mind and body, he passed his first night. He had a few books with him, but Mr. Ruddyman was not much of a reader. In the garden of the inn, or somewhere near by, he found a spot of shade, and there, pipe in mouth, was content to fleet the hours as they did in the golden age. Now and then he tried to awaken his host's interest in questions of national finance. It was one of Mr. Ruddiman's favourite amusements to sketch budgets in anticipation of that to be presented by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he always convinced himself that his own financial expedients were much superior to those laid before Parliament. All sorts of ingenious little imposts were constantly occurring to him, and his mouth watered with delight at the sound of millions which might thus be added to the national wealth. But to Mr. Fouracres such matters seemed trivial. A church warden between his lips, he appeared to listen, sometimes giving a nod or a grunt. In reality his thoughts were wandering amid bygone glories, or picturing a day of brilliant revenge. Much more satisfactory were the conversations between Mr. Ruddyman and his host's daughter. They were generally concerned with the budget, not of the nation, but of the pig and whistle. Miss Fouracres was a woman of much domestic ability. She knew how to get the maximum of comfort out of small resources. But for her, the inn would have been a wretched little place, as indeed it was before her time. Miss Fouracres worked hard and prudently. She had no help. The garden, the poultry, all the cares of house and inn were looked after by her alone, except indeed a few tasks beyond her physical strength, which were disdainfully performed by the landlord. A pony and cart served chiefly to give Mr. Fouracres an airing when his life of sedentary dignity grew burdensome. One afternoon, when he had driven to the market town, his daughter and her guest were in the garden together, gathering broad beans, and gossiping with much contentment. "'I wish I could always live here,' exclaimed Mr. Ruddiman, after standing for a moment with eyes fixed meditatively upon a very large pod which he had just picked. Miss Fouracres looked at him as if in surprise, her left hand clasping her chin. "'Ah, you'd soon get tired of it, sir.' "'I shouldn't. No, I'm sure I shouldn't. I like this life. It suits me. I like it a thousand times better than teaching in a school. That's your fancy, sir.' As Miss Foraker spoke, a sound from the house drew her attention. Someone had entered the inn. "'A customer?' said Mr. Ruddyman. "'Let me go and serve him. Do let me.' "'But you wouldn't know how, sir.' "'If it's beer, and that's most likely, I know well enough. I've watched you so often. I'll go and see.' With the face of a schoolboy, he ran into the house, and was absent about ten minutes. Then he reappeared, chinking coppers in his hand, and laughing gleefully. "'A cyclist. Pint of half and half. I served him as if I'd done nothing else all my life.' Miss Fouracres looked at him with wonder and admiration. She did not laugh. Demonstrative mirth was not one of her characteristics. But for a long time there dwelt upon her good, plain countenance a half-smile of placid contentment. 
When they went in together, Mr. Ruddiman begged her to teach him all the mysteries of the bar, and his request was willingly granted. In this way they amused themselves until the return of the landlord, who, as soon as he stabled his pony, called Mr. Ruddiman aside and said in a hoarse whisper, "'The prince comes to-morrow.' "'Ah, does he?' was the answer, in a tone of feigned interest. "'I shall see him. It's all settled. I've made friends with one of the gardeners at Woodbury Manor, and he's promised to put me in the way of meeting his royal highness. I shall have to go over there for a day or two and stay in Woodbury, to be on the spot when the chance offers.' Mr. Fouracres had evidently been making his compact with the aid of strong liquor. He walked unsteadily, and in other ways betrayed imperfect command of himself. Presently, at the tea-table, he revealed to his daughter the great opportunity which lay before him, and spoke of the absence from home it would necessitate. "'Of course you'll do as you like, father,' replied Miss Fouracres, with her usual deliberation, and quite good-humouredly, but i think you're going on a fool's errand and that i tell you plain if you just forget all about the prince and settle down quiet at the pig and whistle it'd be a good deal better for you the landlord regarded her with surprise and scorn it was the first time that his daughter had ventured so to express herself unmistakably the pig and whistle he exclaimed a pothouse i who have kept an hotel and entertained his royal highness you speak like an ignorant woman hold your tongue and don't dare to let me hear your voice again until to-morrow morning miss fouracres obeyed him she was absolutely mute for the rest of the evening save when obliged to exchange a word or two with rustic company or in the tap-room her features expressed uneasiness rather than mortification the next day, after an early breakfast, Mr. Fouracres set forth to the town of Woodbury. He had the face of a man with a fixed idea, and looked more obstinate, more unintelligent, than ever. To his daughter he had spoken only a few cold words, and his last bidding to her was, "'Take care of the pothouse.' This treatment gave Miss Fouracres much pain, for she was a soft-hearted woman, and had never been anything but loyal and affectionate to her father all through his disastrous years. Moreover, she liked the pig and whistle, and could not bear to hear it spoken of disdainfully. Before the sound of the cart had died away, she had to wipe moisture from her eyes, and at the moment when she was doing so, Mr. Redman came into the parlour. "'Has Mr. Foraker's gone?' asked the guest, with embarrassment. "'Just gone, sir,' replied the young woman, half turned away, and nervously fingering her chin. "'I shouldn't trouble about it if I were you, Miss Foraker's,' said Mr. Ruddiman, in a tone of friendly encouragement. "'He'll soon be back, he'll soon be back, and you may depend upon it there'll be no harm done.' "'I hope so, sir, but I have an uneasy sort of feeling. I have indeed.' "'Don't you worry, Miss Fouracres. When the prince has gone away, he'll be better.' Miss Fouracres stood for a moment with eyes cast down. Then, looking gravely at Mr. Ruddiman, said in a sorrowful voice, "'He calls the pig and whistle a pothouse.' "'Ah, that was wrong of him,' protested the other, no less earnestly. "'A pothouse, indeed. Why, it's one of the nicest little inns you could find anywhere.' "'I'm getting fond of the pig and whistle. A pothouse, indeed. No, I call that shameful.' The listener's eyes shone with gratification. "'Of course, we've got to remember,' she said more softly, "'that father has known very different things. I don't care what he has known,' cried Mr. Ruddiman. "'I hope I may never have a worse home than the pig and whistle.' and i only wish i could live here all the rest of my life instead of going back to that beastly school don't you like the school mr ruddiman oh i can't say i dislike it but since i've been living here well it's no use thinking of impossibilities towards midday the pony and trap came back driven by a lad from woodbury who had business in this direction Miss Fouracres asked him to unharness and stable the pony, and whilst this was being done, Mr. Ruddiman stood by, studiously observant. He had pleasure in every detail of the inn life. 
Today he several times waited upon passing guests, and laughed exultantly at the perfection he was attaining. Miss Foraker seemed hardly less pleased, but when alone she still wore an anxious look, and occasionally heaved a sigh of trouble. Mr. Ruddyman, as usual, took an early supper, and soon after went up to his room. By ten o'clock the house was closed, and all through the night no sound disturbed the peace of the pig and whistle. The morrow passed without news of Mr. Foraker's. On the morning after, just as Mr. Ruddyman was finishing his breakfast alone in the parlour, he heard a loud cry of distress from the front part of the inn. Rushing out to see what was the matter, he found Miss Foraker's in agitated talk with a man on horseback. "'Ah, what did I say?' she cried at the sight of the guest. "'Didn't I know something was going to happen? I must go at once. I must put in the pony.' "'I'll do that for you,' said Mr. Ruddyman. "'But what has happened?' The horseman, a messenger from Woodbury, told a strange tale. Very early this morning, a gardener, walking through the grounds at Woodbury Manor, and passing by a little lake or a fish-pond, saw the body of a man lying in the water, which at this point was not three feet deep. He drew the corpse to the bank, and, in so doing, recognized his acquaintance Mr. Fouracres, with whom he had spent an hour or two at a public-house in Woodbury on the evening before. How the landlord of the Pig and Whistle had come to this tragic end, neither the gardener nor any one else in the neighbourhood could conjecture. Mr. Ruddyman set to work at once on harnessing the pony, while Miss Fouracres, now quietly weeping, went to prepare herself for the journey. In a very few minutes the vehicle was ready at the door. The messenger had already ridden away. "'Can you drive yourself, Miss Foraker's?' asked Mr. Ruddyman, looking and speaking with genuine sympathy. "'Oh, yes, sir, but I don't know what to do about the house. I may be away all day. And what about you, sir? Leave me to look after myself, Miss Foraker's, and trust me to look after the house, too, will you? You know I can do it. Will you trust me?' "'It's only that I'm ashamed, sir.' "'Not a bit of it. I'm very glad, indeed, to be useful. I assure you I am. "'But your dinner, sir?' "'Why, there's cold meat. Don't you worry, Miss Foraker's. I'll look after myself, and the house, too. See if I don't. Go at once, and keep your mind at ease on my account. Pray do.' "'It's very good of you, sir. I'm sure it is. Oh, I knew something was going to happen. Didn't I say so?' Mr. Ruddyman helped her into the trap. They shook hands silently, and Miss Foraker's drove away. Before the turn of the road she looked back. Ruddyman was still watching her. He waved his hand, and the young woman waved to him in reply. Left alone, the undermaster took off his coat and put on an apron, then addressed himself to the task of washing up his breakfast things. Afterwards he put his bedroom in order, about ten o'clock the first customer came in, and, as luck had it, the day proved a busier one than usual. No less than four cyclists stopped to make a meal. Mr. Ruddyman was able to supply them with cold beef and ham. Moreover, he cooked eggs. He made tea, and all this with a skill and expedition which could hardly have been expected of him. None the less did he think constantly of Miss Fouracres, about five in the afternoon, wheels sounded. Aproned, and in his shirt-sleeves, he ran to the door, as he had already done several times at the sound of a vehicle, and with great satisfaction saw the face of his hostess. She, too, though her eyes showed she had been weeping long, smiled with gladness. The next moment she exclaimed distressfully, "'Oh, sir, to think you've been here alone all day, and in an apron!' "'Don't think about me, Miss Foraker's. You look worn out, and no wonder. I'll get you some tea at once. Let the pony stand here a little. He's not so tired as you are. Come in and have some tea, Miss Foraker's. Mr. Ruddyman would not be denied. He waited upon his hostess, got her a very comfortable tea, and sat near her whilst she was enjoying it. Miss Foraker's story of the day's events still left her father's death most mysterious. 
all that could be certainly known was that the landlord of the pig and whistle had drunk rather freely with his friend the gardener at an inn at woodbury and towards nine o'clock in the evening had gone out as he said for a stroll before bedtime why he entered the grounds of woodbury manor and how he got into the pond there no one could say people talked of suicide but miss fouracres would not entertain that suggestion of course there was to be an inquest and one could only await the result of such evidence as might be forthcoming during the day miss fouracres had telegraphed to the only relatives of whom she knew anything to sisters of her father who kept a shop in london possibly one of them might come to the funeral well said mr ruddyman in a comforting tone all you have to do is keep quiet don't trouble about anything i'll look after the business miss fouracres smiled at him through her tears it's very good of you sir but you make me feel ashamed what sort of a day have you had splendid look here he exhibited the day's receipts a handful of cash and with delight decently subdued gave an account of all that had happened i like this business he exclaimed don't you trouble about anything leave it all to me miss fouracres one of the london aunts came down and passed several days at the pig and whistle she was a dry keen elderly woman chiefly interested in the question of her deceased brother's property which proved to be insignificant enough meanwhile the inquest was held and all the countryside talked of mr fouracres whose story of course was published in full detail by the newspapers once more opinions were divided as to whether the hapless landlord really had or had not entertained his royal highness plainly mr fouracres presence in the grounds of woodbury manor was due to the fact that the prince happened to be staying there in a state of irresponsibility partly to be explained by his intoxication partly by the impulse of his fixed idea he must have gone rambling in the dark round the manor and there by accident have fallen into the water no clearer hypothesis resulted from the legal inquiry and with this all concerned had perforce to be satisfied mr fouracres was buried and on the day after the funeral his sister returned to london she showed no interest whatever in her niece who equally independent asked neither counsel nor help mr ruddyman and his hostess were alone together at the pig and whistle the situation had a certain awkwardness familiars of the inn country folk of the immediate neighbourhood of course began to comment on the state of things joking among themselves about mr ruddyman's activity behind the bar the undermaster himself was in an uneasy frame of mind when miss fouracres aunt had gone he paced for an hour or two about the garden the hostess was serving cyclists at length the familiar voice called to him will you have your dinner mr ruddyman he went in and before entering the parlour stood looking at a cask of ale which had been tilted forward we must tap the new cask he remarked yes sir i suppose we must replied his hostess half absently i'll do it at once some more cyclists might come for the rest of the day they saw very little of each other mr ruddyman rambled musing when he came at the usual hour to supper guests were occupying the hostess having eaten he went out to smoke his pipe in the garden and lingered there it being a fine warm night till after ten o'clock miss fouracres voice aroused him from a fit of abstraction i've just locked up sir ah yes it's late they stood a few paces apart mr ruddyman had one hand in his waistcoat pocket the other behind his back miss fouracres was fingering her chin i've been wondering said the undermaster in a diffident voice how you'll manage all alone miss fouracres well sir was the equally diffident reply i've been wondering too it won't be easy to manage the pig and whistle all alone i'm afraid not sir 
Besides, you couldn't live here in absolute solitude. It wouldn't be safe. I shouldn't quite like it, sir. But I'm sure you wouldn't like to leave the pig and whistle, Miss Fouracres. I'd much rather stay, sir, if I could anyway manage it. Mr. Reddiman drew a step nearer. Do you know, Miss Fouracres, I've been thinking just the same. The fact is, I don't like the thought of leaving the pig and whistle. I don't like it at all. This life suits me. Could you, he gave a little laugh, engage me as your assistant, Miss Fouracres? Oh, sir. You couldn't? How can you think of such a thing, sir? Well, then, there's only one way out of the difficulty that I can see. Do you think... Had it not been dark, Mr. Ruddyman would hardly have ventured to make the suggestion which fell from him in a whisper. Had it not been dark, Miss Fouracres would assuredly have hesitated much longer before giving her definite reply. As it was, five minutes of conversation solved what had seemed a harder problem than any the undermaster set to his class at Longmeadows, and when these two turned to enter the pig and whistle, they went hand in hand. End of chapter 15 Recording by Kirsten Weber End of The House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing